All right, in this lesson, we're going to go ahead and talk about Nmap. As far as the board scanning goes here, we've talked about a few other different types of uh, scanning methods that you can use. And now we're going to talk about the de facto standard here that most people will stick with. Now, there's other port scanners that are out there and available, but most most in the security field can kind of agree that Nmap is kind of the default, has the most you know feature set, as you can imagine. And it also includes a lot of other different tools built into it as well. And it is cross-platform, so excellent way to do it. If you have the GUI version, it's going to be called ZenMap, but we're going to be dealing not with the GUI version, but instead we're going to be dealing with the command line version uh, of Nmap in this case here. So this is the Nmap website where you can download it from, and they have a variety of different uh, talks about it here. It's pretty interesting that it's been used in quite a few movies. I didn't realize how many it was actually used in, like 12 movies it says here. Uh, like Matrix Reloaded and things like that, where they actually have Nmap scans and things, which is kind of interesting. But uh, this one here is a great tool to use, and it also includes this security tools list, which is pretty awesome, um, which gives like a top 125 security tools ranked by popularity and by uh, security professionals in the field. So pretty cool stuff. So Nmap, like I said, is a port scanner, which we're going to use now. So I've got a few different things open here. Let's see. I've got my domain controller over here, and I've got a uh, version of Metasploitable 2 running over here, or actually just Metasploitable. And then i got my Kali Linux. So let's talk about some of the basics here when you're using Nmap. So Nmap will first start off if you just do a default scan and don't put any switches. It'll do what they call a stealth scan, okay, S capital S. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, if I wanted to go ahead and just do a basic scan of an IP address, so if I said nmap and then I said 10.0.0.104, something like that, and I just hit enter, it'll go ahead and do a basic scan here. It won't give me all the information that I would like, but we're going to get into how you can change a little bit of that up here in a few minutes. So by running nmap by itself without any switches, it's going to be doing something they call a stealth scan. So there's a few different types you can use. One is called a TCP full connect scan. And the full connect scan is exactly what it sounds like. I do a full syn, 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 synac ac three-way handshake, and I fully connect to the port. Now, that's the most reliable, but it's also the most noisy um, from the end of the, like if you're, if you're doing a pen test and you're trying to scan in and try to keep yourself from prying eyes of the administrators, the TCP full connect scan is not the one you want to use because it's really noisy because a lot of IDSs will look for and log and monitor full three-way handshake connects. But it is, like I said, the most reliable because you are fully connected to the port, wherefore you can actually guarantee, yes, the port is open in this case here. Whereas with the stealth scan, it does it a little bit differently. It sends a SYN, and then the destination, if the port is open, will send a SYNAC, and then me on the source end here from, from uh, sending, the, for sending the scan, I will send an RST. And what that basically will do is it will stop it from doing the three-way handshake. So it won't actually fully connect. And the idea is I don't really need to do a full connect here to verify that its port is open because it actually responded back to me with the SYNAC telling me that it's open. So I've got my answer already and the session done. So same thing will go as well. If the port is closed, it's going to send an RST back to me because it, it's not open. So therefore, I know I don't have to send another packet back to it. And so they kind of call it a half open scan because you don't do the full three-way handshake. So by default, if you don't add any switches, it does that particular scan there. So by doing this one here, by not adding any switches, we can see that this one computer here has a ton of different ports open for you to peruse. Now, in this particular case, what it did essentially at the beginning is it will take any host name, like if I did it based off of the actual host name of the machine, it would actually do use DNS to go ahead and resolve that particular one there. But if I wanted to skip that, I would use a dash N, N as in Nancy. So that one will disable being able to or having to do DNS recursion. The other thing it will do after that usually is it will ping the target first to verify that it's live. And that one also could be a little noisy, or they could actually have ICMP disabled so the scan wouldn't work properly. So you can add a dash P 
PN, and then that's capitalized. So basically what that would look like, uh, let me do it actually from another window so we can talk about the ports here. What that would actually look like would be nmap dash n, so in other words, disable the DNS recursion dash capital P dash n for the uh, disable in the ping as well, and then the actual IP address after that. Okay, I'll select that. Um, now in this case here, we can see that we got a bunch of different ports open and we see a service beside it. So we have HTTP there, we got shell, looks like they're using some NFS shares, all kinds of different things. So in this case, if that is what's going on there, the thing that I'm really con you know considering here is I don't actually know what versions of HTTP they're using, for instance. I don't know if they're using Apache. I don't know if they're using IIS. I don't know what version. So we can add another switch to the mix here, and it's called S capital V. Now, when you do a little case S, that's basically saying script type. And then from there, whenever you add another letter to the end of it, it's telling what type this really is. So in this case here, if I said nmap dash n, so we can disable DNS recursion in this case here, and do dash S capital V like that, this is what they would call a version scan, okay? A version scan. So if I did that, and then 10.0.0.104, uh, specifically looking for those ports that are open on there, and hit enter, it'll go ahead and run a scan. Now, this one will actually take a little bit longer to run uh, because of the way that they do things. But let me go over here real quick while we're waiting on that scan. And let me give you a little cheat sheet that we can kind of create here. Choose some basic notepad here. So a couple different ones, like for instance, the dash N, we already know. And that one is to uh, disable the DNS recursion. And then we also have the dash PN, which is disabling pingin. Okay. And the one we just did here was S capital V, which was a version scan. Okay. And when we look at the results of that particular one here in a few minutes, you'll see that it should tell us the exact versions of all these different services that are running on that particular machine. So let's go back here and take a peek, see if that thing's done yet. Excellent. All right. So here we can see, if I scroll up a little bit, there we go. So here we can see that they have FTP, but it also tells me now the version, VSFTPD 2.3.4. Here we can also see that they're running, let's see, HTTP. It looks like they're running Apache here, so that's interesting to note. And everything else pretty much listed here as well, being, basically telling me what's going on. Uh, there's VNC. Looks like some old school Unreal IRCD right there. Pretty wild stuff. <laughs> Can't believe this stuff's still rocking there. And then down here, we can see it does a uh, operating scan as well. So pretty awesome. Now, we can also add a dash capital O instead of the S capital V. And we can say capital O like that. And I believe that this one, let's see if it tells us down here in the bottom. All right, so right there, down at the bottom, telling us what version it's doing. And notice it says here, OS detection performed. Okay. So that's basically what they're doing is they're doing an OS detection, an operating system detection, okay? And where they're getting all this information, I'm trying to remember the full name of it. Um, I think it's called nmap dash, or no, actually, OS dash probe, I believe. Was, no, maybe it's not. Uh, let's see here. CD USR slash... Trying to remember the exact path. Okay, that's not it. Um, what is the name of that? Oh, uh, let me think here. All right, let me pause for a second because I'm trying to remember the actual path for it. All right, so I remember what it was here. That's what's great about this recording stuff where you can pause it if you uh, forget a, a certain path. So it's called nmap-service-probe. So if I go over here to this location, usr slash share slash nmap, and I do an ls, we'll see here there's a few different 
uh, files here. So the OS one, for instance, was right here, OSDB. And it does a variety of different probes that it has already built into this. So let me leaf pad this real quick here. And what this basically does is it sends a variety of different probes out to the operating system that we're trying to scan. And if it responds back with a particular expected response, it'll verify and say, oh, well, based off of the response back from the probe that I had sent it, it tells me that it's this particular operating system. All right. So, for instance, if I were to look up, you know, Windows and this list here. That's probably come up quite a few of them actually. So let's look specifically for Windows 7 here. All right. So here we can see Windows 7 Professional is one of these right down here. And I just went past it too far. So we'll just go with whatever we see here. So right here it's telling us Microsoft Windows. This one specifically being in Server 2008 Service Pack 2. And what it's doing is it's actually running these particular probes against it. And if it responds in a certain way, or if it responds at all, it'll know, okay, well, based off of what I've sent it and what it responds with, I can determine that this is actually with a high degree of probability that this is probably Windows Server 2008 Service Pack 2. So it's not 100%, but it does actually do a fairly good job at it. Same thing happens when we did the SV scan. It bases off this Nmap service dash probes to determine what it's actually looking at. So it sees port 80, HTTP open, and it sends some probes to it to determine what is the actual service running on there. So it will respond back with Apache 2.2.3 or whatever it may be based off of what's in that particular file that's highlighted there. So there's quite a few things that it can actually do pretty well in this case here. Um, so the idea is what we're trying to do is we're trying to get as accurate a description of what we're having for an OS. So that's another switch we can add to the mix. So we'll say dash capital O. And that will be for operating system detection. Okay. Now another thing that we can do as well, which is pretty interesting, is scripts. So there are scripts that are allowed here using what they call NS, uh, .nsc format that is used in Nmap, and you can extend the functionality of it and turn it into basically an exploitation tool as well with a variety of different other things. So there are some scripts called default scripts, and I'm going to do the command first, and then we're going to go take a look at what I'm talking about. So if I do uh, my Nmap, and we'll do S capital C, and then we'll say 10.0.0.1, oops, .104. Okay, we'll run that. Over here on Nmap, there is a section specifically for scripts. So if I look up the Nmap script in reference, uh, oops, wrong one. There we go. So if we look at the script in the interface, you can see there's a variety of different categories. One, specifically for authorization stuff, broadcast, here's some brute force stuff. And you can go down through and look at all the different scripts and see exactly what they do. Well, there's also a default one. So the default one has a variety of different ones that they run. So I'll give you a couple examples here, um, like right here. HTTP methods. So when you do HTT methods, you have options on there like get, um, post, you know, things like that. This will go ahead and look to see what methods are allowed. And there's another one that has the title, I believe. This one here looks for the robots.txt file. And as you click on each one of them, it will basically give you a description of what they are, what category they fall into, and some example usage of how to use it. Okay. Now, in this case, I could run just the scripts by themselves. But we're going to talk about that in a later part of this lesson. But for now, just know that I can run these individually if I would like. But look at all of the ones they have. They get SMB stuff. They get SNMP. They get uh, SQL. They get S SSL. They got a ton of these different ones here. When I did the S capital C, it's running every one of these. Now, obviously, the, the site may not have anything to do with half of these. 
uh, or even maybe even 90% of it. Maybe it's only like 10% is worth, you know, is what is actually on that server. It will run these scripts and determine it based off of what it's found. So, for example, if I scroll up here, Okay, you can start to see here, for instance, they had a script called FTP Anon to see if the actual anonymous FTP was allowed. In this case, it's telling us, yes, it is allowed. Here, open SSH one. It tells us a SSH host key. And as we scroll down a little further, let's see here. SMTP, it tells us what commands are allowed on that one. There's some HTTP ones they ran. So like here, it gives us some methods. Plus, it does a banner grab to find the title of it here as well. Pretty awesome stuff. This one gives us some RPC information for our remote procedure call. So you can see all these different scripts that is pertaining to what this server actually has available. It will actually run it. So for instance, it looks like they're running MySQL. And uh, yeah, so it tells us here what version and protocol and all that kind of good stuff there. Pretty awesome stuff. So running just that script there will run everything in the defaults if you run the S capital C. Okay. Now I'm going to do another one real quick while I, before I go back and write the SC into our little cheat sheet here. I'm going to say nmap dash n dash capital A 10.0.0.104 and enter. Okay, I'm going to let that run. That one will take uh, a minute or so. So let's come back over here and we'll go ahead and say dash S capital C. And this one is for running the default scripts and every time you update your end map you're going to see more than likely that people have added some more scripts to it and if you look at the page currently i believe there is let's see looks like there's about 529 scripts included now there are some people that use like github to be able to go ahead and uh add scripts to it and stuff like that so you you can go to somebody else's github be aware that it's somebody else's that is embedded here by Nmap, so there's the possibility that it could be, you know, malware or whatever. But be aware that people will host a lot of this stuff, like on GitHub, their own little NSC scripts that they use in their uh, environments. So S capital C is what I ran there for the default scripts. Now the one I just ran a second ago is dash capital A. And this is what they call an aggressive scan. Now this one will definitely be picked up by a good um, administrator and buy some IDSs and stuff because this one is extremely noisy and the reason why is because it runs a variety of different scans so what it will run is s capital oops, capital v so it will do actually let me let me do it this way runs version scan and I'll note that it's uh, s capital v it will also run a Operating system scan, which we now know is dash capital O, runs script scanning, which we now know is S capital C, and runs trace route. Okay. So in this particular case here, by running that one command, it's it's basically wrapping a bunch of the most commonly used ones that we would have here in our map scans into one switch so it's a pretty handy tool but it is it does take a while to do it and it is very noisy so as you look at it here this is what we got our results from here you can see that it ran the scripts again okay and it did the regular version detection as well so basically I, I guess you could say kind of the same as what we did with the uh, script scanning one, except this time it added in trace route. It should have added in also the operating system detection and things like that. So at the end of it here, uh, let's see right here, you can see it did a trace route as the last part. So it's a pretty handy tool to use. It's called dash capital A, and it's called aggressive scanning. Okay, aggressive scanning. Pretty awesome stuff. Now there's a way that you can also do a ping scan, and that would be S capital P. But in my opinion, it's just not as fast as another way that I like to do things. But, for instance, I'll just tell you the switch for it. So let's go back over here. And we'll say dash S capital P. Ping scan. And the idea of a ping scan is when you actually go ahead and first start doing your scan. And based off of what you had off your recon phase, 
you want to go ahead and do scans of either subnets or IP addresses, but you want to first see in a subnet if anything is actually alive and running, right? We want to make sure and see, hey, is there any machines out there? Is there any IP addresses that are that are awake and alive? And then when we find those IP addresses, we can do those individually. Now, there's one I use. We're going to take a slight deviation from NMAP for a second. The one that I like to use, a little bit quicker for me, is Net Discover. What you do is you give it the interface that you're using, which in this case for me is ETH0, and then dash R, and then you're going to put the subnet. So in our case, it's 10.0.0.0 slash... 24 okay so hit enter on that what it will do is it will go ahead and scan out and it will do this basic ping here and it does it really quick so right here I can see I've got a dot 10 address and I've got a dot 104 address it doesn't it doesn't pick up our address of the attacking machine but it picks up the 10 picks up the 104 so I know now these are two targets that I can go ahead and screw around with and this is how you would start before you do any type of scanning at all with the S capital V and the dash A and all that stuff. You would do this, and you would find your targets that you can actually use in this case here. Now, when you're actually looking specifically to scan a particular port, you can use it a variety of different ways. So, for example, if I did a dash N and I decided to look for port 80, I can do a dash P 80. Now, another way I can do it as well is I can do dash P80 like that. So it doesn't actually have to be separated like that. You can just put them together. That is legitimate. I can also scan a range. So I can say 1-200 to scan a range of ports. So port 1 through 200, see if anything's out there. If I want to go ahead and scan all ports, I can do a dash P dash. Okay. Or, of course, I could do the 65,534 in there for my number as well if I wanted to, but that's that's way you can do it there. If I wanted to scan uh, different ports that were not, like, in a row, I can do, like, 80 and then comma 443. So I can scan different ports by typing in or putting in the comma in between the different ports that I'll be using in this case here. Now, I can also go ahead and do specifically TCP or specifically UDP. So, for instance, I can do a capital T colon, and I can say 25 comma 80. And then I can do a comma and do a capital U colon. And then from there, I can say, you know, 161 comma 137, whatever I want to put in there. But that would also have to involve using a particular switch with it. Okay. Uh, in this particular case here, if I wanted to, I could do... Let's do a dash S capital S and a dash S capital U. I'll talk about that in a second here. Let's give it an address here, 10.0.0.104, and hit enter. So as you can see right here, it's given us a few different ports. Now, I had specifically looked for the ports of 25, 80, 161, and 137. Now, you'll notice that if I go ahead and just did our normal scan, notice up here, Let's scroll all the way to the top here. When we first ran our scan, take note how every single one of these on the left-hand side all say TCP. Okay? Notice how they all say TCP. Now, coming down here, we notice, wait a minute, there's actually a UDP port 137 open. Why did that not get picked up in the normal scan? Because it doesn't do UDP scans by default. So to do a UDP scan, let's come back here to our cheat sheet here. S capital U is the UDP scan. Now, it's kind of slow if you did it by itself without any other switches, but it, it's a decent a decent tool. Another good tool to use for that would be like the Unicorn Scan, if you've ever seen that one. That one does things a little bit quicker because you can run a lot of things in parallel. But in this case, you notice here that it did find some, some uh, UDP ports that were listed. Um, but the thing is that you have to add that switch to it. Even though I had this capital U colon right here, it still wouldn't have found it if I didn't include SU. So, for example, if I came back here, kept everything as is, got rid of the SU, you'll notice that it does not pick up any UDP ports. Okay? Same thing goes for if I added SU but took out the S capital S, you'll notice it just does UDP ports. Okay? So it does not look, look for... TCP, unless I have a switch 
ahead of it when I do it with the T colon whatever numbers I'm adding here. Okay, so that's an interesting thing to think about there as well. You can also do an Nmap scan based off of the name of the service in this case here. So I can say, for instance, Nmap-N, then I can say HTTP, and I can also add in a asterisk here to give it a kind of a wild card target in this case. Or I can just say HTTP and then 1000.104 and run it that way. Okay. So in this case here, HTTP, um, you know, whatever, what are the ports that you have, what are the services that are running on there you can actually use for that. Okay. So that's how you would actually use that method. So some of the other scans you can use, there's ST, and that one does a full connect. So that one would be, oops, hold on. Let me get rid of this here. So that one would be dash S capital T, 10.0.104. And that one does a full connect scan. Now, we didn't do any version scan or anything with that. So that one is dash S capital T. That is a full connect scan. It is noisy, but it is reliable. Okay, because it does the full three-way handshake. It fully connects to the ports, but because of that, it will probably be logged in an IDS. So do keep that in mind. The other one we've been using as well is the S capital S called the stealth scan, also known as the half open scan as well. Okay. Now, another one you can also do as well, but it doesn't work with uh, Windows, <laughs> is the Xmas scan. And that would be dash S capital X. And that sends scan with urge, push, and fin flags set. And the idea there is to try to go ahead and bypass again an IDS by using a little trick there by doing the S capital X listed on there. Okay. So, for example, if I were to run that here, let me first bring up Wireshark. Show you what I'm talking about here. All right. So I'm going to capture on ETH zero. And we'll start that. Okay. So I'm going to do this against the Linux machine. So if I said nmap dash S capital X and put in 10.0.0.104. It'll basically do the scan as it's supposed to do the scan, like normal scan stuff. But what it will be doing is it's actually set in a flag of uh, urge, push, and fin. So, again, we're trying to bypass an IDS or try to keep out of the eyes of the administrators in this case here. Let's take a look at our Nmap scan as it's rocking here. Looks like our scan is done. So, as you can see, it still does a legitimate scan. It doesn't do a version one, but it basically does a regular scan here. And if we come back and we close this out here. You'll notice these flags being set, fin, push, and urge, okay? Fin, push, and urge are the flags being set, all right? And anything that's not open, it's going to usually respond with an RSTAC. Usually if it's open, it will have no response. If it's closed, it will go ahead and have an RSTAC for Linux. Now, in Windows, if you tried to run this against a Windows machine, it is always going to return an RSTAC because this is another one of those things where Microsoft decided not to follow along with the standard way of doing this protocol and the standard responses. So only with Linux will you get this particular response. Okay, But that's one that you can use. Um, another one that you can do as well is you can just set a fin flag. And again, this is to try to bypass IDSs. So we'll say sets, oops, sets fin flag on that one. And you can also do an S capital N, and that will set no flags. And it stands for null scan. Okay. So for instance, if I go back here, by the way, the fin scan and the null scan also do not work with Windows. Now, when I say that means it doesn't work, I means it will always return RSTAC even if the port is open or if the port is closed. So it's obviously unreliable because it says the same thing for both of them. Even if the port is open, it still says RSTAC. Um, so let's go ahead and run another capture. Let's see. Oops. Start that back up. And let's come back over here. And this time we'll switch out the X for a capital N. 
wait for it to do its ARPS. Let's see here. Okay, while we're waiting on that one, let's do another cheat sheet article here. S capital A, ACK flag is set. Check in if port is filtered or unfiltered. So if there's a packet filter in place or whatever, that's kind of the idea of doing the S capital A one there. All right, so let's take a look at what we got here for response. Scroll up. Notice how it says none right here. Now my address is 10 100. That's the attacking machine. So we can see there's the source. It's not sending any flags, but it still responds. Now in this case here, if the port is open, it should be a no response. If the port is closed, it should be an RST ACK. Okay. So in this case here, let's go back and notice still does our normal scan. Then lastly, we have our S capital A, and I think this one actually will work against Windows. So I'll do it against my Windows machine here. So we'll say S capital A, 10. And all we're basically checking to see is if a port is open, or actually, let's do it this way. I'm going to just specifically point out port 80 for this one here. And it will tell whether or not it's filtered or unfiltered in this case here. And I believe I have IIS running on that machine. Let's check a look here. Uh, yep, looks like it. So we're good there. All right. So right here it tells me that it is filtered right there. And that's the idea of using the uh, S capital A switch in this case is to determine whether or not a port is open or closed and if it's filtered or not. Okay. And that's basically it. So those are some of your more basic ones. I mean, there's other switches that you can use as well. But those are some pretty common ones that you would find and you would use out there um, to be able to, uh, you know, choose, depending on your target, whether or not you want to be caught, whether or not you want to try to be a little sneakier than other ones. That's kind of how you would do that. Now, another thing you can also use as well is you can actually go ahead and set it up with timing. Now, the timing is a little bit interesting because it goes, I believe, from zero to five, where five is the fastest and zero is the slowest. So sometimes people will ask, well, why do I want to scan the slow? Well, the idea is this, again, trying to bypass or trying to get away from the all CNI of Sauron as the administrator. So in this case here, if I do a time in, let me do this back here, it's going to be a dash, capital T, and then it's either going to have a zero through five, and I'm going to say time in, scan, five is the fastest which also means it's probably the one that's the noisiest okay so the idea of this is if i were to go ahead back here and run a scan uh, we'll just do a uh, let's do a capital t5 like that and i'm going to scan the whole of it there we go it's going to do it fairly quickly, or at least we hope it's going to do it fairly quickly on this one. Um, but the idea is that if I were to go ahead and do a T1 instead, or a T0, that is going to take forever. It's kind of like send a probe, wait. Send a probe, wait. <laughs> and it's usually going to be a determined amount of time, so maybe 100 seconds, maybe 15 seconds, 15 minutes, whatever it may be. So in this case here, that's kind of the idea of doing it. So if you can see how that one was actually fairly quick, how it did it. Um, but if I do the T, let's do T1 here. T1, and I start adding in VVV or DDD, which it should type in here for debug mode. And actually, let's do it this way. Let me add in the very verbose and we'll also do a couple dds there as well for debug and you'll see here it gives you a timing report when you add that in there and it's extremely slow so you'll notice there's a scan delay there and if it's a tcp port it's going to wait a thousand seconds before it sends another probe so it's kind of like pop and then wait a thousand seconds pop 
and then wait a thousand seconds and then do it again. So basically, when you do something like this against a large network, start the scan and then go get some groceries, go watch a movie, take your wife or husband out for a date, whatever. Because uh, by the time you get back, it'll probably be done. <laughs> it may take a day or so. But this is why these penetration tests will take a little bit longer in some cases because they're running these type of scans to try to make sure that the administrators don't see what they're doing. What they're doing. So again, we're trying to get away from the all CNI of you know the administrator in this case here. Okay, so I'm going to control C on that one there. But the timing is definitely a big key thing. Now, what about outputs? Because we want to go ahead and put these into a report, maybe, or have it so I can read it later what the actual scan was. Well, for that one, you can use a dash little case O and then uh, a corresponding letter. So in this case here, if I did nmap, uh, let's do nmap dash O, and I'm going to say capital A for all of them, just to kind of show you all the scripts that you can run. And I'm going to give it a name, so I'll say raise scan, and then I'll say 10.0.0.10, okay, and hit enter. What it will do is it will go ahead and put this into different formats. You won't actually see it here because it's actually writing it. Now, what you probably will see is just the regular Nmap one. And it comes in three different flavors. You have the ability for greppable. You have the ability for the normal Nmap one. And then you also have XML. So for that, it would be dash O. And then you would have either A for all. Actually, let me do it this way. Uh, A for all. You can have G or greppable, which is searchable. And I don't know if I spelled that right. Uh, N for normal, which is our normal NMAP output. And X for XML. So it will be dash O, G, O, N, O, X, that kind of thing. Okay. So original gangster on it for greppable, N for normal, X for XML. I did the all format, so let's come back and check what we got going on here. So this is the normal output that you would see. Now notice when I do an LS here that it actually gives me those three. So here's the greppable one. There's the normal, or it just does NMAP, and there's the XML. Okay, so you can view any of these. Like the greppable one will look like raise, let's see, dash scan dot gn map so right there you can see it's separated by the slashes that are listed there uh, the xml one pretty easy on that one as well xml you can see it's in an xml format and of course the last one being just n map oops and it's just the regular normal output so that's a way you can do it on there as well which is pretty awesome loving life on that and uh, that is a way you can copy it out, and you can use style sheets and do all that kind of all that kind of business there as well. All right, let's talk about scripting a little bit here. Now we had mentioned before the S capital C runs the default scripts. The extension for it is NSE, and the language being used is Lua, L-U-A. So if you know how to script in Lua, there is some syntax that you can look up on the scripter reference on the Nmap website to teach you how to actually make different script types and stuff. But if you were just going to go ahead and look to see what scripts are out there, you can say nmap dash dash script dash help. And then you can go ahead and give something like FTP dash asterisk quotation. So let me go ahead and rerun that again, show you what I'm talking about. So when you say nmap and you say dash dash script dash help, you're just basically saying I want to find help files on all these scripts that begin with FTP dash. If I didn't want to have that and I just want to have any script that has FTP in it, I just say FTP, right? FTP asterisk, asterisk being our wild card. In this case, I'm looking specifically for any scripts that begin with FTP dash. So in this case here, we know there's already an FTP on this uh, machine that we've been scanning. And we do know it allows anonymous login. So what I can do is I can add in this script, FTP and on. I can also check to see if they're avail or, um, vulnerable to the bounce attacks. I can also check for, oops, scroll down a little bit here. I can also check to see here if I can see this back door. Matter of fact, I am going to look for that one. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that, like so, and scroll down. And you can do this with basically any of these if you wanted to look for just SMTP, HTTP, whatever you're looking for. You just type in basically what you're looking for, and then you give it a dash and then an asterisk for the wildcard, and then it will look specifically for any of that stuff there. Okay? So in that case, if we now know that information, let's go ahead and do a script for it. So I'm just going to say dash n. We'll say dash dash script equals. So when you want to run a script, you'll say what it is. You'll say dash dash script equal, and then you'll put in the name of the script. So in our case, I am going to run the VSFTP backdoor one. We'll do a comma here so we can add some other ones to it. We'll do the FTP dash anon as well. And we'll run that against 10.0.0.104. Yeah, 104. And let's scroll up here. So right here you can see that the anonymous FTP allowed was there. So it does allow it. We saw that. We don't see the other one, which tells me basically it's probably not vulnerable to the VSFTPD backdoor that uh, is pretty prominent with that, with that particular one there. So that's basically how you would use a script. So anytime that you have a service that you're looking for, you just basically say nmap, and then you give it a... Uh, script, I'm sorry, dash dash script dash help equals and then quotation asterisk and enter. Okay, so again, and map dash dash script dash help equals and then whatever you're looking for, whether it's HTTP, SMTP, whatever. Okay, those are the ones that you'll be using on that. So it's a pretty good engine to be able to use um, to be able to expand some of the things it can do because it will actually allow it to be an exploitation framework as well, which is pretty handy if you're using it in the pen test. So you can see pretty full featured there. So scripting, definitely the way to go. All right, let me show you another thing here. We're going to utilize Nmap with what they call Metasploit Framework. Now I'm going to talk about Metasploit Framework more in detail in a system hacking uh, module that we're going to do. But for now, to run it, I have to actually start a service called PostGre SQL Start. Now, this has changed in newer versions of Kali Linux. This one's the 1.0 version I'm using here. But in the newer versions, the next command does not work. Okay. So I'll say service metasploit start. In the newer versions, it's going to be msfdb init. That's going to be the one that you're going to want to run there for that one. So if you're running like the 2016 version of Kali, you'll run it for that. Same thing with Apache. They changed that one as well. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. But anyways, so uh, I started my Metasploit here. To start the actual console, you just type in MSF console and then hit enter. It takes a bit for it to come up. Now, what we're going to do with this particular uh, discussion on this one here is... In Metasploit, it's a framework that you can use that has all the exploits. I used it earlier in one of my scanning videos when I did the break into Windows XP. So it actually is a framework that has a variety of things like uh, payloads and it has uh, post, uh, post exploitation, scanning capability, all kinds of different things. But it can integrate with Nmap and you can use the PostgreSQL database to store different targets. So let's say you had uh, two jobs for a pen test company and you ran scans and you want to make sure that you have in a database so that you can query it like a database, you had two different scan types. In this case, you would use the DB command. So to make sure that it's connected, you say DB underscore status when you bring up Metasploit. It should say PostgreSQL connected to MSF3. If it doesn't, that means the commands we ran a minute ago didn't run properly. Go back and check your spelling because it will do that if you didn't start the PostgreSQL first, okay? So now that I can see that I'm actually connected to the MSF3 database, I would then say DB underscore Nmap like this, and then from there I can do my scan. So I can say dash A, 10.0.0.104, okay? And what it's basically going to be doing is it's going to be doing the same exact scan that we did earlier with the dash capital A, but this time it's going to enter it into a database called PostgreSQL. 
Now, this will take a few minutes to run, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the uh, recording for a second so that I can get it to run, and then we'll come back and take a look at it after that. I'm also going to go ahead and, and uh, do one for the dot ten machine, which is the, the Windows machine, so that we actually have two different ones. But we'll do that after I show you a few different things first. Okay, so I'm going to pause for a second. We'll come back when the scan is done. All right, so the scan is now done. Now I have it actually in my database. So what I can actually do here is I can say services dash p. Oops, stop typing for some reason. Services dash p, and we'll say eighty tac u, and it will show us basically, you know, pulling from the database of this particular machine. Now, if I had scanned a whole entire subnet, then I would have all those actually listed there as well. Now, if I want to find out the hosts that are actually here, I do a host dash U, and it tells me that it's the zero, the 104 one, okay? It's the Linux one. So in this case here, we can see that it has port, proto, name, state, info, and it's basically like querying a database, okay? So in this particular case here, that is in this workspace called default. And what they call workspace, I'll type this in here, workspace-h. You can see here that I can list all the workspaces that I have, and I can add workspaces as well and switch to one of them. So let's pretend that one job was this machine here. And I had another job that was the other machine, the dot .10 address. So for that, I can list to see what I actually have. And you can see an asterisk by the word default, meaning that is the one that it's in right now. Now, obviously, it's the only one that's there, so of course it's going to be that one. But if I start adding in one, like workspace dash A, Angelina, for Angelina Jolie, because she's awesome. Okay, now if I do workspace again, boom, it puts it into that workspace now. So if I were to do a host tack U here, there ain't nothing because I haven't done any scans. So now that I'm actually in this database, I'm going to go ahead and do the same nmap scan again, nmap dash n dash capital A. This time we'll do it against the 10.0.0.10 .0 .0 machine. And I will pause the recording and we'll come back when this scan is done. Okay, so that one's done now. So here we can do our host dash u. If I can click inside of there. And we can see here, whoops, that's actually not listed in there. Hold on. Do, 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 workspace. Okay, we're in the Angelina one. So if I were to... Oh, you know what I didn't do? <laughs> I did it incorrectly. I apologize. And this is a good thing that we have it here so that you ver verify what you, what you may have done wrong if you do it this way, now you have a way to verify and say, oh, well, the instructor actually did it the wrong way originally, too. What I forgot to do, and the reason why the information isn't here, is I did not use the DB underscore nmap. I just did straight nmap. So we'll do that again here. For you guys, it won't be very long because, again, I'll be pausing the recording, but that's a good way to catch your mistake there. We're human. We're not inerrant. So let's go ahead and put a 10 there. And there we go. All right. So we're going to come back after I pause this when it's done, and we'll actually get it listed in there with some information. Okay, we're back. And as you can see here, it actually put it into the database now because I did it the correct way the second time. So that's one way to uh, think about for troubleshooting purposes. If you forget the DB underscore nmap, it's not going to enter it into it. You can see that it accurately found out that it was running a Windows Server 2012, which is good. Got the MAC address, and we got the other things listed there as well. Pretty awesome stuff. Now, if I wanted to, I can switch back workspace like that, and this time I can do a I'm trying to remember now. I think it is dash. Okay, just the name. So I can say workspace default. So let's say that I'm actually going back, and I'm working on the first one that I originally originally scanned for company A and not company B, which was the Angelina one. Now when I do this workspace default and then type in workspace here, you can see the asterisk defaults back to the default one listed there. Now I can again do my host dash U, and it's specifically the Linux one and not the 2012 server one. Okay. 
Now, you can also query things based off of the column names and such. So I can say, for instance, hosts, oops, hosts, and then a dash C for column, and then give the name of the column that I'm looking for, so like address. And then we can say comma uh, OS underscore name, like that. And what it will do is it will take those two values or those two columns, and it will list it out there in this case. Okay, And anything you see out there, you'll see it listed. So if I wanted just the MAC address as well, I could do the same thing. I'd say host dash C, and then I can say uh, address comma MAC. Okay, If I just wanted those two that are listed there. So it's pretty handy to be able to do that. Now you can also do it by services as well. So I can say services... Oops, there we go. Services, and they also have columns as well. So we'll say uh, column of name, and let's go with, um, I don't know, how about port, and maybe proto. Okay. So here we can see that, it, scroll up here a little bit. Okay, right there. So here you can see it's going to give me the actual name. It's going to give me the port and the proto, because that's the three columns that I had asked for from that. So I'm basically querying it like it was, you know, a normal, like, SQL database, things like that. So it's pretty handy to be able to use this particular tool here to make and scan systems and have them in a database ready to go so that you can check them. Now, if you need to export it into a comma-separated value, you can do that as well. So you can just basically say, for instance, hosts uh, dash uh, let's see. Well, actually, let's do let's do this last one. Roll in that last one there, and then we'll go ahead and do a dash O for output, and then I'll put it here in root, and I will call it raise stuff dot csv. Okay, so right there, I now would have that in. Let me exit out of this in there. So you can see the comma separated value. I can say cat raise stuff dot CSV and it lists it out there in comma separated value. So dash O is your output that you're going to be using with the Nmap scan. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about some evasion techniques real quick. So if I'm trying to evade the all CNI of the administrator and I'm trying different tricks, one of the things you can do is try a different source port. So when you're, when you're coming at a, a network and you're doing a scan, your source port and your source address is going to be probably something that they don't recognize as a legitimate service or a port. So in other words, your port number leaving your attacker machine is probably like 4,902 or whatever it may be. Something that's in the higher end, not the top 1024 ports, and their administrator is going to say, wait a minute, we've got a scan coming in here from this particular strange port. We don't even know what the heck it is. That's something that's going to catch their eye, and they're going to be like, whoa, we need to delve a little further into this. So in this case here, what you could do is you could spoof the port of the scan. So for instance, if the administrator sees a port 53 or a port 80, he's going to be like, Okay, I understand that. That's DNS 53. Uh, if there's a 67, all oh, that's DHCP. So to them, it's not as eye-catching as 4,928 or whatever port. You know what I mean? So the idea is that we try to spoof the source port. Now, in Nmap, you can spoof DNS 53. You can spoof TCP 20 for FTP. You can uh, spoof Kerberos TCP 8080. I'm sorry, 88. And you can spoof the DHCP UDP 67. So to do that, you say nmaf, then you do your dash n, but this time you do a dash g, or you can do a dash dash source dash port to do the exact same thing. So in this case here, let's just do that. We'll say dash dash source dash port, and I'll say 53 in this case here for my scan. And we'll go against 10.0.0.104. And to make it quicker, we'll just look for port 80 in this case here. So in this, in this instance, we're looking at doing a scan, and we're looking like we're coming from source port 53, but with a port destination of 80 in this case here. So we can see the port is open, life is good, and I believe if we go ahead and run that in Wireshark, we should be able to see that 
the source port is being 53 there. So let's capture that real quick. Okay, good, good, good. Oops, I already had one open. I didn't see that. Okay, there we go. So let me go and run that again. So source port 53. Come back here. Stop the capture. All right, so there's my 10.0.100. And you'll notice down here where it has domain, it says 53. Right there where I've highlighted so right there, it tells me that it's, you know, to the administrator who's looking at this packet capture, he's seeing something come from 53. So maybe he's not monitoring that particular port because it's a well-known port that they use at that particular workplace. Okay, so that's an example of one there that you can do for an evasion. Pretty cool stuff. Another one you can also do on this case here is you can do fragmentation where it breaks it up and splits up the packet into smaller little packets because Nmap scans have a particular size and signature to them. So if, they, if the uh, administrator has any type of security bone in his body and he understands what the size is of an Nmap packet, he'll probably be looking for that so that he knows if somebody's using Nmap against his system. But if I break it up into smaller little bits, then that changes the game altogether. And that one is just a dash F. So you can do a dash F 10.0.0.104 and do the scan that way. And that's doing fragmentation for it. Another one that's pretty handy is dash dash scan dash delay 15.5s, something like that. It's basically saying send a probe, bing, and wait 15, 15 and a half seconds. Send another probe, bing, and wait 15 and a half seconds. Because if an administrator is monitoring the, the network and it sees a hammering, a bunch of scans going on one after the other, boom, 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 right, after, right, in, right in a row um, quickly, He's probably going to think that's a ping sweep or a port scan going on. But if I can just kind of just throw a packet in there and then mix it in with regular, normal, everyday traffic, and then, bing, throw another one in there, mix it in with everyday traffic, bing, throw another one in there, and so on and so forth, the idea is to do it slow enough and uh, just throw in probes here and there. It still does the scan. It takes a lot longer. But you're trying to, again, avoid the eye of the, of the machine itself. Another one that's kind of cool is the decoy scan. Now, I don't actually have multiple machines here to be able to do this but um, I got two I think I can do so this one's an interesting one if I did an nmap dash n and then I did a dash capital D I can put an IP address of let's say 10 comma 10.0.0.100 10.0.0.104 what I'm basically trying to do here and let me run my Wireshark on this one What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to do a scan, but I'm trying to make it look like other machines are doing the scan as well. So if you knew there were some other machines in the network, if you knew their IP addresses, and there were legitimate machines that the network admin recognizes the IP address of, he may not worry so much about it because it's basically going to be throwing me in a crowd of people Base is what's kind of going on here. It's kind of like if you had 100 people and I just inserted myself into the crowd It'll be difficult just to find me because there's 100 people there. Same idea here is trying to get myself lost within the sea of IP addresses that are scanning. So all of these machines, if you, if you knew there was a 100 different IP addresses of machines that were in the network, you would do a dash capital D and put every single one of those IP addresses and do the scan. So you can see here that the scan came from dot .10, which was DC1, and it came from my machine. So imagine if I had a hundred other ones listed there, the admin's gonna be like, well, which one's the bad guy? Right? Because he would have to check and vet every single address to be accurate. So it's a it's a it's a ploy to try to uh fool the administrator into thinking, you know, whether or not there's an actual attack gonna be happening in this case here and who it's coming from. So it's a pretty interesting way to do it. Another way you can do it is randomize hosts. So you can say nmap dash n dash dash randomize dash host whoops there we go randomize dash host and the idea of this one here it's with an s i'm sorry and the idea of this one here is if i were to go ahead and scan a 
a bunch of ports in succession, port 1, port 2, port 3, port 4, port 5, port 6, all right down in a row. An administrator will see that and say, wait a minute, this is successive scans, one right after the other, in, you know, in contiguous format. So he will probably be like, oh, okay, something's going on here. It's probably a port scan, and he'll probably shut that down. So this one here will do it randomly. So we'll do like one port, and then we'll do like this totally other random other port. So you're basically just randomizing the scan that you're doing instead of doing it all in succession. Okay. So those are some ways that you can actually implement that. Pretty awesome stuff listed on there. One last thing I want to go over is a pretty stealthy technique that you can use. Now, I don't know if this will work properly on here or not. I'm going to try it. Hopefully it will. Um, but I haven't tried it actually. I should have probably tried it before the video started, but uh, now it just came to my mind about this, and this is a pretty cool technique. Um, but the concept is this. It's called the idle scan. If I had a attacker, so I'm going to say A for attacker, V for victim. Well, actually, let me draw it out real quick. It'll probably be easier for me to explain this. This is a pretty interesting attack here. Oh, let's see here. All right. So if I had attack a machine here, and I'm going to call this one down here, Z for zombie. And over here we'll say is the victim. Okay, and we'll say port 80 is open on that machine. Okay. All right, so in this case here, the Z for zombie would indicate that a computer on that guy's network, on the, on the victim's network, there's a computer that doesn't, that isn't doing anything at the time. That's what we're looking for. If we can't find one, we can't do this attack. But if we could find a computer on that guy's network that is idle and not doing anything, okay, no packets leaving at all, coming or going, that is what I'm going to call my zombie. That's my huckleberry. That's the bad boy I want right there. So what I'm going to do then on the attacking side is I'm going to send a bunch of packets to this zombie computer. Now, the idea of when you're doing this, you know, when you're doing TCP IP stuff, is that when a packet leaves your computer, it increments a number called IPID, okay, IP identification. So if a packet leaves your computer, it will increment that by one, okay? So if two packets left, it increments by two. If three packets left, it increments by three, so on and so forth. If no packets leave your machine, it doesn't increment the IPID number. So if I were to run a particular uh, HPing3 with a SYN packet set, to the zombie and it responded to me okay if it responds to me that means a packet is leaving the zombie computer going back to me in this case i'm looking at the output and i'm looking at the ip id number if i'm sending in this continuous stream continually sending to the zombie and it's continually responding that ip id number is going to increment by one so one two three four five and I can monitor that in a separate window. If I can see that it's not jumping to like 5 and then jump into 10 and jump into 20, I know that other packets are not leaving because if, if, the, if they were jumping like that, that means other traffic is going on and other packets are leaving that machine. So if I see it just doing one, I know I'm the only cat that is actually getting anything out of this zombie computer. Okay. So now that we have that and that's still going, I haven't stopped it, that's still going. Let's say I wanted to scan this port of this machine right here, and it's port 80. We'll pretend the port is open. I would send another crafted packet using HPing3 because that's what HPing3 is for, is for uh, packet crafting. I would send one with the SYN flag there and try to see if port 80 responds. Now, if I send a SYN to a port that is open, it should send me back a SYNAC. That's the response I should get. In this case, though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the source address from my packet that I've crafted and replace it with the zombie's IP address. So, therefore, when I send a SYN to the victim, it will send a SYNAC if the port is open, but it will send the SYNAC back to the zombie, not to me. Now, the zombie never initially sent the SYN. Therefore, when it gets a SYNAC out of nowhere... 
and it never sent a sin, the zombie's going to be like, what in the world? What is this garbage? And what it will do is it will send an RST. It'll say, close this connection, player. I don't know where you're coming from. I've never heard of you. I've never sent a sin packet. Why are you sending me this noise? That's basically what's going on. Now, remember, when a packet leaves a machine, it increments the IP ID number. So in this case, if I'm monitoring and I'm still sending packets to zombie myself, they're incremented by one. If I sent this other packet that I just crafted and it sent a sin act to the zombie and the zombie sends an RST, for that one moment in time, it'll jump to two. If it jumps to two, if I'm monitoring it and I see the IP ID go boom to two, I know port 80 is open on the victim because port 80 responded, Z responded back to port 80 with an RST. Tricky, tricky, tricky little hoppuses on that bad boy right there. Let me tell you, that is stealthy. In this case, if the port was closed, the victim then would send an RST. In this case, it would send the RST to the zombie again because I spoofed the source address. And when a computer gets an RST, it doesn't have anything it has to respond with because it's just saying reset. It's done. There's nothing that I respond with, meaning that nothing leaves the zombie computer. If nothing leaves the zombie computer except for the traffic I've been hammering it with, and that's just going by one, and it just stays going by one, I know the port is closed. Tricky, huh? Let's see if we can get this working. In effect, it works. I've done it for a different class, <laughs> but I haven't actually tested it on this one yet. But we're going to test and see if it will work. So here's the basic premise of it. So first, I'm going to run an HPing3 dash capital S. And let me see here. Let's do, okay, port 80 is open on that other machine. So I'm going to let, I'm going to have the 104 address be the victim in this one. And we'll do the zombie as the 10 machine. Now, I don't know if any traffic is going on with the 10 machine. So let's go ahead and verify that. So in this case, we'll send a packet over to 10.0.0.10. And this is to verify whether or not it's idle. Give a second here. Okay, it's hanging up. Let's try this. Packs transmitted. Okay, it's not actually showing me. What I'm looking for there. So let me try. Okay, that's better. We'll do it that way. Alrighty, now let me see if. I'm trying to remember if port 80 was open. Okay, and see, it's not actually showing the IDs here. So it looks like these machines may not be able to work for it. Hmm, interesting. Uh, let me see here. Let me see if I can bring up without crashing my system here. Let me bring up an XP machine. I don't want to use too much of my memory here. Whoa, that's getting close. Get close to topping out there. So we'll see if I can do it off of this one here. If not, I'll show you the commands that you can run on yours to be able to do that. All right, let's go ahead and log in here. And I'm going to auto address this one real quick. We'll call this one uh, 10 0 0 5, 105, I guess. Okay, we'll go with that. Good to go. All right, we got to make sure nothing's actually leaving packet wise. Close all windows. All right, let's see if this will run on this one here. All right, there we go. So we can see an ID number there. It says 7980. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at the middle. That part right there. 
So notice how it's right in succession. Okay, sweet. So we can see it's right in succession with each other. I'm going to move this window down a little bit here and let that to continue to run. So that computer is idle. There's nothing else going on on that machine. Excellent. Next, keep an eye on that IP ID field down there on the bottom. I am going to go ahead and do an HPing3, and we'll do a dash A, and we'll do it for 10.0.0.103. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 105, which is the XP machine. So we're spoofing the address of the XP machine here so it gets the packet sent back to it. Dash capital S for send packet, specifically port 80 of 10.0.0.104, which is the Linux machine in this case here. I'm going to do a count of one packet, so it should only jump by one, So, or I'm sorry, by two. So look at the ID numbers on the bottom there in the middle, the 153, 154, 155. I'm going to do it at the top of the numbers here. It's 58, 59, boom. See how it went from 59 to 61? I'm going to run it again. So keep an eye on that ID number right there on the bottom screen. Okay, see how it says 171, 74. Oops, now it's jumping by two. I gotta wait till it get idle again. Okay, looks like it's idle again. So 197, 198, boom, boom. See that? It went from 199 to 201. So that tells me the port is open. Now I know for a fact that port 81 is not open. So if I were to come back here and do 81, look at the numbers again. 218, 219, boom. Notice how it doesn't jump by one. It still keeps going in succession. Do it again. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. So it's still doing it. So it tells me that that port now is closed. Pretty crazy, tricksy little hobbitses we got rocking and rolling on that bad boy. So that is a way that you can use a extremely stealthy way <laughs> to go ahead and scan a machine in your environment. So I hope you learned some uh, good stuff here about Nmap and how you can use it to scan the machines. Don't forget our disclaimer, do not do this against machines that you have no permission to do it on because it is illegal. Okay. All right. So that is it then for our scanning module.